In the early 19th century, a British physicist, Thomas Young, did perform in front of the Royal Society of London an experiment which, to these days, if you talk to physicists and astronomers all over the world, probably remains the most beautiful and profound experiment of physics ever done, the double slit experiment. With this experiment, Thomas Young was able to show that light did indeed exhibit an undulatory nature, and it managed to do this by producing interferences between two light sources. Let's see how he did it. The double seat experiment uses two coherent light sources. Well, I'm not going to look into how those light sources are made coherent, we just assume we have them ready to go. So uh, this is how our setup is, is made. This is our first source, S1. Uh, and S1 is at the origin of a series of spherical waves that propagate from S1 all the way down to the end of our uh, setup right here. And just like for S1, we have a second source, S2, also at the origin of spherical waves that propagate all the way down to the end of our setup. Now keep in mind that what I'm showing here on the screen is not something that our eyes would be sensitive to, uh, because our eyes cannot, uh, are not sensitive to the electric field. Um, instead, what we're going to sense is the intensity associated with that electric field. But you now know that um, when two light sources are coherent, what you're going to do to compute uh, the intensity of that light is first to calculate, to add up the electric fields associated to those two sources, which would look something like that, and would look very much like what you would observe if you were to make an experiment, say for example, looking at um, waves at the surface uh, of, um, of water. Now, the detectors we use, just like our eyes, are sensitive to the intensity associated to that electric field. Uh, that is the square modulus of that electric field, which looks somewhat different something like this, that does not vary with time. And what you see are um, interference fringes. What, um, what you would want to look like is, I'm sorry, what would you want to look is far away enough from the source so that the, the effects due to the uh, near position of the sources can be neglected to work in a regime called the far field uh, limit, you would want to look at a uh, what happens to the light, cutting a slice through uh, this plane here, and just look at how the intensity profile evolves as a function of the location along that axis. And you measure something that looks just like this, a sinusoidal profile, uh, where you alternate between bright and uh, dark fringes with a period that um, is uh, the same all the time and a period that happens to be only a function of the separation between uh, the two uh, sources. Now you've heard that we now work with interferometers that employ more than two telescopes at a time. Um, here's the example of the VLTI, uh, which is now equipped with instruments that can combine up to four telescopes together. How do we do that? Let's revisit Young's experiment and see what will happen if instead of just two sources you add the third one. The setup is very much like the previous case. We have first source S1, the second source S2, and the third source S3. Now with three sources you can form three pairs of uh, sources that are going to interfere with one another. You can think of the one we just looked at, S1 and S2, that's going to produce the fringe pattern we just observed in the previous experiment, but you also have shut down S1 and turn on S2, S3, you're going to get um, a slightly different fringe pattern with the spacing of the fringes that changes because the distance between S2 and S3 is a little shorter. 
And of course, you also have the last uh, S1, S3, which produces thinner fringes, um, simply because the distance between S1 and S3 happens to be larger than everything else. Now, if you uh, turn all three sources on at the same time, you get a fringe pattern that uh, is slightly more complicated to interpret. Um, right? You get some structures that do repeat themselves, There's so a, some kind of periodic structure, but with a um, not so trivial to interpret. And if you were to do just like what we did earlier, cut a slice of the intensity along this axis, you would measure something like this. The solid curve, the solid blue curve you see here, uh, is the curve of that intensity profile measured in the far field um, from away from the three sources here. So clearly not something that you would be able to interpret right on the fly. But you are now equipped with the mighty Fourier transform that will help you interpret this data. So let's look at exactly what it shows. Here, I'm showing you um, the example associated to two sets of fringes. The first set is associated to the, the apertures, the sources one and two, and the second set is associated to the source one and three together. So we just take them separately and look at the fringes they produce. And you see, uh, the, you recognize now the sinusoidal um, pattern for both cases. And in the case of 1-3, the period of those sinusoidal uh, fluctuations is uh, shorter than in the previous case, because the distance between 1 and 3 is larger. What happens when you compute the Fourier transform of these sinusoidal patterns and take the uh, square modulus of that Fourier transform, uh, getting something we call the power spectrum, which is nice because it's a real function as opposed to a complex one, then you get um, figures that look like that. In the first case, well, let's look at both at the same time. It looks like we observe a central peak that's um, surrounded by a pair of twin peaks, and the distance of these peaks away from the center seems to be proportional to the, or inverse proportional to the period that we observe here. For example, in the first case, we have a certain period. The, the peaks are at a certain distance. In the second case, where the period is shorter, the peaks turn out to be further away. And so the, uh, the, the, the position of the peaks is going to be proportional to the frequency or the inverse of the period of those sinusoidal fluctuations. Now what happens if you combine all three signals together? You do get that fairly complex function I mentioned earlier, the blue solid curve here, and just as a reference I've plotted uh, in dashed lines the fringe patterns associated to the individual pairs of apertures that uh, we have in our system here. But let's just take a Fourier transform of this um, uh, solid blue curve, and you would get something that looks like that. Uh, what you see is now you no longer have just one pair of twin peaks surrounding the central one, but a forest, in fact three pairs of peaks, one pair associated to uh, one baseline. So somehow, although everything seems to be mixed up in there, via the magic of the Fourier transform, you're going to be able to uh, isolate the components, extract the signal, and somehow get something out of it. Now, all of this was uh, looking at uh, 1D arrays, where the apertures are simply located along a line. And you may wonder, well, what would my patterns actually look like if I were to uh, make interferences from uh, sources or apertures located along a 2D array. And so we're going to look at a couple of examples of 2D physio interferograms that, uh, that just uh, explain that situation. The simplest case is of course to go back to the 2D array. So here we just have two apertures produced uh, right here, S1 and S2, that produce a set of fringes like so, 
and the fringes, the, 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 the axis describing the fringes, happens to be along the direction of the baseline uh, separating the, the two apertures. The period of these fringes is again going to be inverse proportional uh, to uh, the, the, the baseline, the length of the baseline. What happens if you add a third aperture not along the line um, already made by this first baseline, something like this, just like before, you now have three apertures, therefore um, three possible baselines. And uh, we have the first baseline, which uh, just like in the previous case, produces fringes in this direction along this axis. But on top of that, we also have a second baseline here that produces fringes along this direction. Now we do see some periodic structure in those images along this direction. And finally, a third baseline right here that produces uh, structures along this direction. Now, if you co-add these, um, uh, the electric fields of all three and, uh, and take the intensity, you get this picture here, something that looks like some kind of honeycomb structure. Um, but just like in the 1D case, uh, although that the interpretation of this image is not trivial, uh, via the Fourier transform, you're gonna be uh, able to easily isolate the different baselines and measure the strength of the signal associated to each of these baselines. If you go further, add a fourth aperture, the picture gets more and more complicated. In fact, there is a relationship that uh, links the number of apertures, here n, uh, in, in this situation here 4, to the number of baselines you can form, simply the number of pairs of elements chosen among m, which would be n times n minus 1 divided by 2. So for four apertures, you get six overlapping system of fringes that produce this uh, system. In the previous case of three apertures, you get three system of fringes only. So our arithmetic works. Now, if you go to even more complex, richer arrays here with seven apertures and you apply these arithmetics, you see that uh, we can produce up to, uh, we can produce 27 uh, systems of fringes that overlay all together. Let's start making a, um, a structure that, although still somewhat periodic, starts looking a little, um, differs significantly from the, the fringes we originally had. And if you go banana and just keep adding um, apertures, you end up with a very rich array and we'll observe that the fringe pattern that this array produces now differs very little from the airy spot that a telescope of equivalent size uh, without uh, like a, a continuous aperture would produce an airy function with a characteristic size that would be no different than uh, the central peak you see at the center of this interferogram.